Uh, welcome to our presentation this evening, Dainty Desserts for Dainty People, The Feminized History of Gelatin. My name is Krista. I'll be your librarian host this evening from the Poughkeepsie Library. And please join me in welcoming Sarah Wasberg Johnson, also known as the food historian, who'll be giving the talk this evening. Uh, Sarah has been written has written in many academic journals about food history and also has been featured on the History Channel series, Food That Built America. So I think we're in for a treat. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping things. If you are finding yourself being able to unmute yourself, please don't. Please keep yourself muted throughout the presentation. Keep your mics and your cameras off. If you do have any questions or comments during the presentation, feel free to leave them in the chat. Sarah will be checking that periodically. And at the end, there'll be also lots of time for more questions, so you can put them all in the chat uh, if you feel like it. This presentation is also going to be recorded, so if you do think you missed something or you want to watch back anytime, uh, the video will be available on our YouTube channel. You can find that uh, through poklib.org, which is our main website. I'm also going to try to email everybody who registered the link to that video as well. Um, that's pretty much it for me, I think. Um, if you do enjoy this presentation, Sarah will be back in August. Uh, on August 18th, she'll be doing a presentation on the history of fast food. So if you are interested, I'm actually going to drop in the chat right now the Zoom link to register for that. So please do if you haven't already. And if you're also enjoying this presentation and you want to see what else the library has to offer, please check out our website and our calendar of events to see what other virtual and in-person programs we have this summer and a little bit into the fall. And I hope you enjoy. Thanks again, Sarah, for doing this presentation. And if you are having any trouble with you know, technical issues, please reach out to me in the chat. I'll be watching from afar. And uh, take it away, Sarah. Enjoy, everybody. Thanks so much, Krista. So thanks, everybody, for joining tonight. Um, we have a little bit of a two-part program. Um, we're going to start out with a recorded, pre-recorded cooking demonstration that I did. Uh, we're making a historic gelatin recipe. Uh, no spoilers, but it may or may not turn out exactly as planned. Uh, and then we'll dive right into the, um, the PowerPoint where we talk a little bit about the history of gelatin and gelatin companies. Uh, and gelatin in American life. So I'm gonna go ahead and share screen and we'll start with the video. Hey everybody, I'm Sarah the Food Historian and welcome to the Food Historian Kitchen. Today we're gonna be making something that maybe you haven't thought about making in a while. Uh, we're gonna be making a gelatin dessert. Uh, but it's a little different than maybe some of the stereotypical jello desserts you think of today. Uh, we are taking the recipe from this little cookbook. It's called Dainty Desserts for Dainty People. It was uh, put out by Knox Gelatin in 1915. And the dessert we're going to be making today is the Strawberry Bavarian Cream. So it calls for half an envelope of Knox sparkling gelatin, which is just Knox gelatin today, uh, a quarter cup of cold water, one cup of strawberry juice and pulp, which I have already prepared, a tablespoon of lemon juice, which we're going to make here in a second, uh, a half a cup of sugar, and then one and a half cups of heavy cream beaten until stiff. It calls for us to soak the gelatin mixture in cold water for five minutes, dissolve it by standing the cup containing the mixture in hot water, which we're going to do in a second, strain into the strawberry juice mixed with the lemon juice, add the sugar, and when the sugar is dissolved, set into a bowl containing, set bowl containing mixture into a pan of ice water, which we're going to do here, and stir until the mixture begins to thicken, then fold in the cream. Turn into a wet mold, and I actually have, this is a pudding mold, you can tell by the sides here, um, but it's a nice hollow one, which looks a lot like the picture, so I thought we would use that. So turn into a wet mold lined with strawberries cut in halves, which I have here, and chill. Garnish with fruit, selected strawberries, and leaves. A delicious cream may also be made with canned strawberries, but we're going to use fresh today. So that's our recipe, and I think we can go ahead and get started. Okay, so first things first, we have to prepare our granulated gelatin. Now the recipe calls for 
half a packet. <laughs> I have a little packet of Knox gelatin here. I just guesstimated to the best of my ability what half a packet was and it calls for a quarter cup of cold water, which I have here. So we're going to mix the two. I have a fork here. I'm going to just give it a nice stir, get all those lumps out of there. Make sure it dissolves nicely. And then it says to rest it in a bowl of hot water. So I just have some hot tap water here. We're going to let it sit there for five minutes to dissolve all the granules. And we'll set that aside while we work on the rest of the dessert. Okay, so while our gelatin is um, hanging out in its little hot water bath right now, I thought we would go ahead and whip our heavy cream stiff so that it is all ready when we need it to fold into the strawberry mixture. All right, so we need one and a half cups of heavy cream. and we don't have to whip this by hand, which is great. So I have just an electric mixer with the whipping attachment on it and we're gonna beat this heavy cream until it's stiff. You might notice that I have a nice deep bowl and I'm actually tilting the bowl to the side and even though it's an electric mixture, I am moving it in kind of a circular motion. That helps beat a lot of air into the whipped cream and helps whip it up a little faster. You don't want to overbeat your heavy cream or it will turn into butter. Um, so I always err a little bit on the side of not quite as stiff. I'm going to give it just a couple more goes here. Yeah, that looks good. Okay, now we can move on to the next part. Okay, the next part calls for us to take our one cup of strawberry puree, which I have already prepared. Looks beautiful. And again, like, unlike our ancestors, <laughs> uh, I did not have to force this through a sieve or use a food mill. I just use the food processor. But if you want to go the old fashioned route, um, you can if you want to. All right, so there's our strawberry pulp. Now we need a tablespoon of lemon juice. A nice juicy lemon. And it says to stir the lemon juice and the strawberry pulp and juice together. Then we're going to add our softened gelatin. 
which yes, there are no granules left. sugar and stir until dissolved. <laughs> It'll all come out. There we go. Okay, so now the sugar is dissolved and it says to place it in a pan of ice water. I have right here a nice big bowl of ice water and stir it until it starts to thicken. So we're just going to keep stirring and see what happens. Okay, 30 minutes later and I think this is about as thick as it's going to get, which is not very thick, but we're going to try it anyway and see what happens. So the next steps are we have to mix in the fold in the cream, right, and then we have to line our mold, dip it in cold water and line our mold with some berries. So, we'll do the cream first. Now with the whipped cream, when you're folding, you're just going down the middle and turning over. So just cutting through that whipped cream and turning over without trying to stir it too much so that you keep some of that lightness. Okay, our cream is all folded in. As you can see, it's much thicker than it was before because we incorporated that nice airy whipped cream. I'm going to take this out of the ice water bath. We have uh, our mold here, which I have dipped in cold water, and we are supposed to uh, line the inside with halved strawberries. Now, I'm not really sure <laughs> how this is going to turn out, but I will do my best. I'm putting little ones in the middle here, cut side out, because I think that's how they usually do it, but maybe I should do it cut side out. Does it say? No, it just says, in a mold lined with strawberries cut in half. So, we'll do our best to kind of pop them in there. Try and make some kind of pretty design, I guess. See if we can get it in here without the strawberries all falling down on top of themselves. Maybe we'll find out. Oh, gosh. Um, okay, so I have. <laughs> I don't know if you can see, I have a, uh, no, it's falling. I have a design in the bottom. I'm going to put some of the, the um, gelatin in, I think, so that it, it holds these things in place. And then I will put more on top. Because I don't know how else you're supposed to do it, but the strawberries just want to fall down the side.
Hopefully this will be pretty. I'm trying to make a pattern. Maybe you won't even be able to tell when it comes out of the mold. We'll find out, I guess. I sure hope this tastes good because this is a lot of effort. <laughs> That's as good as it's gonna get. All right, and now because this is technically a pudding mold, I have this nice little lid to go on top with these fun little latches. We are gonna stick this mold in the fridge for four to six hours and come back and see if we can't get it out of the mold. Okay, now it's tomorrow. <laughs> um, I did check the mold after six hours last night like it still wasn't set so I decided to leave it overnight. Um, it's now been about 24 hours since we put the mold in the fridge. Um, it still <laughs> looks like it might not be set all the way. It's, I don't know, a little uh, soft still maybe, but we're going to try it. I don't know, maybe we should have had a whole envelope of gelatin instead of half an envelope of gelatin, but that's what the recipe said. So um, we're going to dip it in some hot water for a little bit and then try and invert it on a plate. I predict one of three things is going to happen. Either it's going to unmold perfectly and prove me wrong. Um, it's going to unmold less perfectly and then collapse, or it's not going to unmold at all. So let's see what happens. All right, let's put it in the hot water. See if we can get nice and melty. I'll just give it a couple seconds. Okay, yes, it is melting on the edges now. And now the tricky part and the moment of truth. We're going to invert a plate. Give it a flip and see what happens. Are we ready? Gosh. <laughs> Hopefully I don't drop it. Here we go. Oh, it definitely unmolded. And it is already collapsing. <laughs> and it's very juicy on the outside, but that, my friends, is the strawberry Bavarian cream from the 1915 Knox Gelatin Dainty Desserts for Dainty People Cookbook. Um, it's probably going to collapse, but I'm going to try and cut a piece anyway, and we'll see how it tastes. I already know, oh yeah, that's very, that's very goofy and collapsy. I'm not even going to bother with the knife. I am just going to scoop some of this onto a plate. <laughs> because it is very soft. Wow. Okay. Now it's time for the taste test. Mmm. That is lovely. It, you can definitely tell there's some gelatin in it. It does kind of have that, you know, gelatinous mouthfeel. But it surprisingly has very classic 
strawberry flavor. So if you've ever had strawberry gelatin, this tastes like strawberry gelatin even though we have used real strawberries and unflavored gelatin. And um, the whipped cream just makes everything creamy and delicious. So, it's collapsed more. This is a lot of work. <laughs> For something that's not supposed to be a lot of work. But it does taste very good. And if I had gotten it to set properly, maybe use the whole packet of gelatin instead of half like the recipe called for, um, it would be quite impressive, quite an impressive dessert. Um, but at least it tastes good. Okay, so that's our video. That was my misadventure with gelatin. <laughs> um, okay, Sharon, yes. So I did actually look before I did the recipe. Sharon is asking, she says, I wonder if the packages were bigger in 1915. They were not. I looked it up on historic images of um, the boxes. They're one ounce envelopes, which is what they are today. So, shame on Knox Gelatin. <laughs> Maybe it was stronger in 1915, stronger, more gelatinous gelatin, I don't know. But definitely the, the package, um, the envelope size is the same. So, adventures in historic recipe making. So I think I'm gonna stop sharing this screen and I will share, um, the PowerPoint and we can start talking about the history of gelatin. So if anybody has any questions before we get started, you go ahead and drop this in the chat. Um, I will just say once I start talking, I am terrible at checking the chat. <laughs> I don't like to be interrupted when I'm talking and get off track. So um, if you have questions, I will probably just answer them at the end, but we should have plenty of time for questions at the end. So, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. So tonight's talk is dainty desserts for dainty people, the feminization of gelatin, um, or the feminist history of gelatin. I forgot what title I originally gave Krista, to be honest. So, uh, but we're gonna go ahead and get started uh, with a little bit of way back in the day, what's the origin of the word gelatin? Um, You've seen it probably pronounced or spelled gelatin and gelatine, right? That's how Knox gelatin spells it with an E on the end. They are interchangeable. There's no difference. Um, the one with the E is probably from the French, right? That's the first uh, documented use of the word gelatin. Um, but it has, <laughs> excuse me, some uh, Latin roots, right? To freeze or congeal. And then the spelling without an E the first reference is from 1800. Um, so gelatin has a lot of different uses historically besides food. It is derived from animal products, primarily bones and hooves. So it is not vegetarian or vegan, just so everybody knows. Um, and it was quite popular in early uh, Europe primarily in the United States, although you do see uh, gelatin-based foods pretty much everywhere in the world. So a very common use in medieval England, for instance, was brawn, which in the United States we usually term head cheese, right? So that is a um, mixture of chopped or shredded meat uh, with a very strong broth made from boiling animal bones right, and then you let it gel and set. Um, in some areas of the country, there's a version of that made with cornmeal called scrapple. Not quite the same, it's not as gelatinous. Uh, they, we do have the use of aspic in the 18th century, although that really doesn't take off until the 19th century with the availability of commercially produced gelatin, but it does exist. And of course, these are savory meat-based dishes. We have blancmange, which dates back to the medieval period when it was made with white stock, right, which is usually made with veal or sometimes with chicken or pork, but it's pale, 
um, as opposed to beef stock is dark brown, usually because we use roasted beef bones. Um, and it was originally a mixture of this meat, jelly, and almonds. And then they started adding sugar, and then we get cream or milk added until by the time we get to the 18th century, it's a dessert. And it's no longer meat flavored. Um, wine jelly becomes very popular also. Uh, wine is very strong flavored uh, liquid, which will kind of mask some of the meat flavors of a, of a meat-based jelly. Um, and then there's calves foot jelly. So calves foot jelly uh, is made from the hooves of calves, the hooves and leg bones of calves. Um, it's not as strongly flavored as say beef, gelatin made from beef. Um, but it still has to go through like an incredibly labor intensive clarifying process. And that's kind of before industrial gelatin, all of these gelatinous foods were very labor intensive. So you, especially if you want desserts, jelly desserts, you had to really process the gelatin. First, you had to boil it um, and let it set overnight so it would cool and solidify. And then you take all the fat off the top, you clarify it, you take all the fat off the top. Um, then you melt it again and you strain all the solids out, right? And then often you boil it again with another clarifier, sometimes like with egg or something to get any remaining solids, you strain it again. Um, it can be pretty smelly. It's a process, it takes a long time, it's very labor intensive. So for human history really until the mid 19th century, if you were making a dessert out of gelatin, you were wealthy, right? Ordinary people, it was pretty easy to make brawn and head cheeses, pretty easy um, to make versions of aspic, not the very clear ones, right? Because clarifying the gelatin took a long time and a lot of labor. Um, but the meat-based gelatins were not super difficult to make. The dessert ones where you have to really clarify it and it's clear and sets really nice and firmly and it's flavored with fruits and you're using sugar, which really until we get slavery in in um, the Caribbean and Southern America and South America uh, is quite expensive, right? So uh, it remains kind of the purview of the wealthy until the mid 19th century. There were gelatin alternatives since the beginning. Um, Isinglass is a gelatin alternative that is still used today. It is a collagen that is derived from fish bladders largely the bladders of sturgeon these days. Uh, it is still used a lot in the brewing and winemaking industry to clarify alcohol. So if you've ever heard that some alcohols and wines are not vegan, that's why, because they're using a substance derived from fish bladders to clarify them. Um, you have Irish moss, which I have a nice botanical print here. Um, carrageenan, carrageenan is used a lot today in a lot of different um, ways that we use it today. Uh, so for instance, it's used as a thickener in ice cream, it's used in toothpaste, stuff like that. But Irish moss um, was the Victorian terminology for it. And it's usually used to make milk-based puddings, right? It sets as a pudding. Uh, we have agar which is derived from red algae, very similar to carrageenan. Uh, and then we have rennet, which is used in cheese making. Um, again, an enzyme from the stomach lining of a calf. So uh, if you have a large dairy industry and you have a therefore subsequently large veal industry, because veal is usually male dairy cows, you don't need male dairy cows, um, you had rennet and you could make cheese. Um, so they also made a dessert with rennet um, called sometimes like curds and whey or slips or junket, right? So again, you are using this enzyme to um, thicken and make sort of gelatinous uh, milk-based desserts. That's what most of these are used for because they don't set as firmly as gelatin. So you can't make like a freestanding jelly out of most of these. So early 19th century, we have our industrial food revolution. What are we using gelatin for primarily? Glue. If you've ever heard 
the joke or reference to sending animals to the glue factory. That's what this is. So glue factories sprang up in a lot of areas where there were slaughterhouses, where there were tanneries, right? Because you are using all the parts of the animal, basically. The muscles go to meat, um, the hides go to make leather, and then the bones and gristle and any other leftover bits uh, go to make glue. And glue is derived primarily from gelatin. So if you've heard reference to like animal-based glues, which a lot of um, historic restoration people use because it's reversible, you know, most animal-based glues are fairly water soluble. Um, that's what people are using gelatin for during the industrial food revolution. However, you also have a lot of urbanization, right? And with urbanization, you get the development and interest in the industrialization of foodstuffs because people are no longer producing their own food, right? And with that, you get interest in early food science. People are trying to figure out, you know, the chemistry behind some of our foods and how stuff works and, you know, the properties of different ingredients. So this is all kind of swirling around in the first half of the 19th century, particularly in the United States. So then we get this guy. This is Peter Cooper. He is the accidental inventor of granulated gelatin. And he is a pretty cool guy. Like we should know more about him if you don't already. So uh, he's born in 1791. He grew up in New York and the Hudson Valley. He's really a jack of all trades when he's growing up. He works all over the place in all sorts of different factories and trades. Uh, he's an early abolitionist. And one of his first major endeavors was he opens a glue and isinglass factory, which is how he accidentally discovers granulated gelatin. He is looking for um, different recipes for gelatin-based glues, and he discovers granulated gelatin um, he goes on to be involved, uh, he basically builds the Tom Thumb locomotive, which is an early railroad locomotive. Uh, he's involved in the laying of the transatlantic cable. And most famously, he founds Cooper Union in New York, which is a, uh, starts out as an industrial college in New York. Um, so he applies for a patent for his powder gelatin in 1845. Uh, he starts to market it with fruit flavors at the um, suggestion of his wife. Sarah Cooper, she's pictured there. This is um, one of the few bits of evidence of the Peter Cooper's clarified gelatin package that's left. It's from the Cooper Union Archives. It's just a photocopy of a package that somebody brought in. Um, this reference actually says 1897. So he continued to sell it, which is something I think not everybody knows. You don't see that often in the gelatin history narratives that are out there. Um, but uh, yeah, so they continue to sell it, but um, he, he's not the only one, but he's definitely the first person to really patent and invent um, granulated gelatin. So another early user of granulated gelatin is Knox gelatin, which of course there's the dainty desserts for dainty people um, that we use for our recipe today. So in 1890, Charles and, Nose, Charles and Rose Knox start Knox Shelton in Johnstown, New York, which was Charles's hometown. They had been living in the New York City, New Jersey area. Um, Charles had been a fairly successful salesman and Rose actually saved up the $5,000 needed to start their business. So they had a fairly egalitarian relationship for the time period. He put her in charge of the household and gave her an allowance and said any money from the allowance that she managed to save, she could keep. And as he became a more and more successful salesman, um, the allowance got bigger and bigger, and she managed to put away $5,000 just from her um, economizing on the household accounts. So that's the money that she had saved that they take to start Knox Gelatin. They move back to his hometown in Johnstown, New York, where there are a lot of tanneries, um, and they open Knox Gelatin, which is a granulated gelatin factory. So in 1896, she publishes the first edition of Dainty Desserts for Dainty People. This one is from 1915. That's the version I actually have right here. <laughs> um, and 
they are fairly successful. And then in 1908, Charles actually dies of um, a heart-related condition. And Rose essentially becomes the CEO of Knox Gelatin, which was super unusual for 1908. Um, she actually had to ask for the resignation of at least one of the top executives because he did not want to work for a woman. And she was like, when you can leave. <laughs> She's a really cool person. Um, and she really values her workers. So one of the first things she does when she takes over is she said there's no more separate entrance for workers. Workers are not going to come in the back door anymore. We're all in this together. In 1913, she institutes a five day work week with two weeks of paid vacation and sick leave, which is pretty much unheard of in 1913. So she's super um, invested in her workers and it does pay dividends that she has people who basically spend their whole lives working for an option. In 1916, she, requ she acquires an interest in kind and landsman gelatin manufacturers in New Jersey um, and later basically gets on their board of directors. She then becomes vice president eventually of their combined company. In 1917, she publishes another little cookbook called Food Economy, and she starts a newspaper column called Mrs. Knox Says. In 1929, she becomes the first female director of the American Grocery Manufacturers Association. She had previously been the first female member <laughs> and works her way up to the directorship. Um, and she continues to run the company into the 1940s. Uh, when she retires and her son takes over, um, but she is really a role model for a lot of people um, in her management of that company and the company's success. So I just have a couple of images. Um, this is the page with the strawberry bavarian cream on it in case anyone's in interested. Um, it's actually page 11, so there are some other uh, really interesting uh, recipes in here. The whole cookbook is 41 pages long it is available digitized online if anybody wants to look it up i believe it's at archive.org has a copy as well um and this is i just wanted to talk a little bit about this i'm not really sure why they do this so this is an advertisement from 1909 so this is from right after charles dies but you can see um it's his name on the package and he is like personally guaranteeing it for you and you notice there's a young black child and you may have also noticed um I'll go back to the cover of the cookbook. There is a white child and a black child. And I ran across another advertising reference, not high enough quality to include in this, like it's just very pixelated, um, but it's like, we'll put it in black and white. And then there's a black child and a white child. So I don't know what's going on with the advertising. I haven't been able to find any reference to it, um, but I just thought it was interesting to mention. Maybe it was to, say that Knox Gelatin was for everyone. Maybe it was an advertising ploy to get African Americans to buy it. I don't know, but it's this interesting weird little thing that's that's going on. It doesn't seem to be stereotypically like Southern mammy advertising like you've seen a lot of other food, um, rather racist uh, food advertisements. So just a little interesting aside there. Here's Mrs. Knox, Rose Knox. She was profiled in Green Book Magazine in 1920, not at all related to the Green Book travel guides for African Americans, um, totally separate. Uh, but so she became pretty famous pretty quickly after she takes over um, the company and, and she's lauded for her success. So this is just an example. From 1919, this is an advertisement from the Woman's Home Companion. It says, "Woman, Mrs. Knox says, and um, it's about making home preserves, not actually canning, I don't think, but um, using gelatin um, to make the equivalent of, of fruit preserves. And she's got a cherry sponge recipe there. Not too different from our Bavarian cream, although it uses egg whites. That's the sponge part of it. Um, I see a couple of chats here hold on do we have questions in the chat all right well i can't click on it so whoops um and then i oh i got ahead of myself sorry okay this is supposed to come later ignore this slide it's out of order so in addition to max gelatin of course we have the infamous jello gelatin um pearl bixby weight uh 
takes granulated gelatin, which existed on the market, and decides um, he is going to take on this endeavor of Jello, uh, which is a combination of granulated gelatin, sugar flavoring, and coloring. So he and his wife um, devise this recipe that makes it even easier to make gelatin desserts because everything is already in the package. You basically just have to add hot water, right, to make your gelatin. But he's not very successful at it. He had started out as a cough syrup salesman. And he just can't, he can't make jello work. But his neighbor, literal next door neighbor in Leroy, New York, and interestingly, the, like many of these companies are on the Erie Canal corridor in the Mohawk River Valley. Um, his neighbor, Orator Francis Woodward, is also a salesman and kind of like an inventor, self-made guy. He invented um, a, a product called Grano, which is where Pearl Weight got the um, idea for Jell-O. And he takes Jell-O for his $450 that he pays for it. He hires um, very well-dressed door-to-door salesmen. They start marketing it door-to-door. -door. That gets successful. He, in, he invests a ton of money in advertising and pretty quickly they're expanding um, very rapidly in Leroy. In 1930, so they start with four flavors. In 1930, they in, in, introduced lime jello, which gets super popular. It's still one of the most popular flavors today. Um, in the 1960s, there are the short lived savory salad gelatin flavors, which we can get into a little bit later. And then in 1974, with flagging sales, um, they introduced the Jello Jigglers campaign. So Francis Order Woodward owns the company, I believe, until the 1940s. Um, he sells out to what will eventually become uh, General Foods, <coughs> excuse me, which I think is now owned by Kraft. So there's lots of corporate history in there, but I don't think we really need to go into because it's not that interesting. <laughs> but we can talk about some of the advertising. So this is um, a very similar to the Knox Gelatin, another beautiful little cookbook in my collection, cookbooklet. Um, and again, it's delicate, delightful, and dainty. Everybody likes to use that word dainty when they're talking about gelatinous desserts, right? So this is just a little excerpt from that. And then I just want to go back also, oh, I have to do it this way, sorry guys, to the Cupies. I love the Cupies. So this is a 1916 advertisement um, from a children's magazine called St. Nicholas. Um, and it says, cook or no cook, anybody can do that. So um, the tiny little cupies are filling the gelatin mold with fresh fruit and cream, and they're just adorable, so I had to include them. But it also talks about the flavors. So they had raspberry, strawberry, lemon, orange, cherry. And they also had peach and chocolate for a short time. The chocolate flavor was pretty short-lived. I think by 1927, that one is out the window. And then in 1930, they introduced lime, which is more popular. Okay. So I also have this cookbook in my collection right here. I just had to show the cover and the back cover um, just because it is very pretty. Uh, but I love the back color because like the little sunset color halo is the flavors that they offer. So there's lime, orange, strawberry, cherry, and raspberry. I just thought that was very clever. And you can see already um, this, this book cookbook that is from the 20s, they're already calling it America's most famous dessert, right? So these are a couple of, uh, I think it's Ladies Home Companion uh, magazine um, advertisements. Wow, sorry, my brain's not working. From 1948. And you can see the emphasis is on salads in addition to desserts. That is something that really starts to take off um, in the teens and 20s, these savory gelatin dessert or gelatin applications. Um, you see it in all of the cookbooks, but Jell-O is definitely on the savory salad train. And then the other major company from the Erie Canal, Mohawk River Valley, is not technically gelatin, but I wanted to talk about it, and that is Christian Hansen Laboratories. Um, which was founded in 1874 in Denmark, 1877, they opened a branch in the United States, 1882, they moved to Little Falls, New York. Um, 
And in 1886, they released Hanson's Household Tablets. And that is later renamed as Junket Tablets. So Christian Hansen was a scientist who was studying um, how to artificially create rennet uh, in Denmark and primarily for the cheese making industry. So that's why they opened a branch in New York, New York in the 19th century with huge dairy industry, huge cheese making industry, particularly in the Mohawk Valley, Utica area was huge dairy country. Um, and so they, they start producing these household tablets, right? Because primarily up until this point, they're focused on commercial use of rennet. And they have these household tablets, which later they renamed Junket, and they become super popular. So also in 1897, they published their own little cookbook called Dainty Delicacies for Artistic Desserts, right? There's that word dainty again. Um, and in 1911, so instead of having these little hard tablets they have to crush up, in 1911 they introduced something called Nazneth, which is Hansen backwards. It's like such an early 20th century <laughs> name, but later they just rename it Junket Powder, so it's powdered um, rennet essentially, and then they do offer versions uh, that are flavored, much like other gelatins like Jello. And one of their most popular offerings um, is an ice cream powder, which eventually Jell-O also offers as well. Um, but they're kind of in the same boat. They have similar levels, levels of popularity and the dessert results are the same, even though it's not technically gelatin, I thought we should include it anyway. So this is their um, factory on an island in Little Falls. Uh, Hanson Island is still there, although the factory is not. Um, Junket went through a whole bunch of different companies and is now owned again by a family company in Texas. You can still get it. Um, they also make another um, non rennet dessert called Danish dessert. Um, and then this is another little cookbook that I have. It's so funny. I went through my giant cookbook collection behind me and I found all kinds of gelatin cookbooks, including this one. So I scanned the cover, but you can see I put the back cover on there because um, they have the package images. So they, the tall skinny one is the tablets and the box is the powder, right? Just like Jell-O and gel Knox gelatin. And a lot of their advertising and their rhetoric focus a lot on the use of milk, right? So instead of water and artificial flavoring, right? To make your dessert, you're using wholesome milk talk about later. And then here is an example also if inside of this cookbook, um, their ice cream, their use of junket um, ice cream powder uh, to make ice cream at home uh, without an ice cream maker, by the way, you can just make it in your freezer, which is pretty easy. Still make it if anybody wants to try it. Then there are a couple of more obscure gelatin companies. This is one of the most obscure Plymouth Rock gelatin. The only reason why anybody knows it exists basically is a couple of patents and this cookbooklet, which I also have a copy of. Um, so in 1905, they have a patent for Plymouth Rock phosphated gelatin. It's based in Boston, Massachusetts. They published this little cookbooklet sometime around 1910. It's undated. Um, their patent expires in 1985 and we have no idea what happened to the company. There's like no information on the internet about this company. <laughs> but they give me a little um, description in the front. So the phosphated gelatin means you don't have to add acid to it. It's kind of like um, Knox gelatin also has what they call um, acidulated gelatin. So I think that's part of the setting process. You didn't have to add lemon to the acidulated version. This is the same thing. Phosphate is an, another type of acid. Um, you hear it referenced in, in soda fountains a lot, a phosphate beverage, right? Um, so I guess that's what they decided to uh, make or break themselves with. And they also have a coffee flavor, which makes me think that although they're based in Boston, Boston they uh, probably know their Rhode Island neighbors pretty well because coffee syrup, very popular in Rhode Island, right? And then this, their, their logo is the Plymouth Rock, right? They're based in Boston, not Plymouth. I don't know why. They probably just chose it as an advertising 
scheme, right? Turn of the 20th century, we started to get really interested in early American history. Um, and I just included this centerfold from the little booklet because it has really beautiful illustrations. Um, even though I'm not sure that the actual jello probably tasted very good. <laughs> but it looks pretty and inviting, right? Another gelatin that is less famous but kind of gave jello a run for its money was royal gelatin. Um, a branch of the Royal Baking Powder Company, which was founded in 1863. It's not clear when they developed royal gelatin. Obviously, it's before 1929, which is when this little cookbooklet is from another cookbooklet I have in my collection. <laughs> um, also in 1929, they merged with Fleischmann's yeast and a bunch of other brands to form standard brands. In 1929, they issued this cookbooklet, 14 New Gelatin Desserts. This is the back cover with the box on it. Um, and they were really considered the main competitor of Jell-O throughout the 20th century, even into the 1950s and 60s, you know, very similar. It's fruit, the fruit and sugar and acid and color are already in there. Um, you just have to add boiling water, just like Jell-O. Jell-O actually tried to sue a bunch of competitors. There were a whole bunch, including um, one called o Gel. <laughs> which they took to court for copyright infringement. <laughs> um, but Royal is the one that ends up with the most staying power. Um, it's now owned by Mondelez and is very popular in South American countries and you can still buy Royal gelatin if you want to. Um, so another beautiful illustrated um, cookbooklet, uh, kind of similar, the Royal Fruit Whip um, and the orange Charlotte Russe are kind of similar to the Bavarian cream that we did, but not really. Um, the fruit whip just means you're whipping the gelatin before it's fully set, so you just whip air into it, which is kind of fun. And then this is an advertisement from the 1960s. I'm like, let's bring back blackberry flavor. What? That sounds awesome. Um, but just an example that they continued well into the late 20th century and are still around today. So how come gelatin gets to be so popular? We did a review of some of our brands and how they came to be, but what is it about Jell-O that captures the Amer American imagination? And why is it so associated with women, right? So let's talk about women and food. Gelatin, surprisingly, is connected to prohibition. So women in the 19th century did not really eat out Restaurants were largely the purview of men until the late 19th century. Women um, might attend like public balls and things like that, um, might maybe go to a tea room, but usually not. Most of the um, food that was consumed by women outside the home was consumed in other women's homes, like for dinner parties and stuff like that. Um, but prohibition, which really takes off toward the end of the 20th century and ends up with actual prohibition um, means that Americans are issuing alcohol and instead they're eating a lot more sugar, a lot more sugar, especially women. Um, you get the development of tea rooms like this one from the Thousand Islands. Looks to be about 1915, this image, it's not dated, but looking at their clothes, that's the time period. So all of a sudden you have middle and upper middle class women who have money, they have friends. Um, you also get the development of soda fountains as acceptable, wholesome public places for people to gather, for women and children to gather, young people. You get the rise of the ladies who lunch at these tea rooms, right? And why do we have ladies who lunch? Not just because they're friends, but also because they're involved in women's organizations. So turn of the 20th century, if you do not belong to some kind of women's organization as a woman in the United States, you know, what's wrong with you? <laughs> there are sewing organizations, there are charitable organizations, religious-based organizations, you know, fun literary organizations, there's organizations with other clubs like the Order of the Eastern Star and you know stuff like that. These fraternal organizations have their female offshoots. There's the church ladies auxiliary. There's um, 
organizations of women in World War One with the war effort, you know, public education, public sanitation campaigns, like women are to middle class and upper middle class women are like hanging out together all the time. <laughs> and so when you do that, what do you want to do when you get together with your friends? You want to have a little snack. You want to have a cup of tea. Right? So people start hosting tea parties and bridge parties, right, for socializing and entertaining. And so you get the development of this very specific particular style of food aimed at women. And gelatin plays a role in that. Salads, cakes, puddings, lots of sweet things, light foods, dainty foods, right, gelatin desserts and salads fit 100% into the rhetoric around what kind of food women are eating. This is an example. This is from Marshall Field and Company um, around 1919, I believe. This is their tea room, right? Look at this beautiful fancy place. You have tables for two, tables for four, tables for six in the back. It was a place, a beautiful public place, safe where women could go and meet. Um, you also start to have department store lunch counters, right? Um, this is all kind of going on at the same time. This advertisement, I'm sorry, the quality isn't that great, but I love this one. This is for Knox It says, whenever the club meets, the problem of what to have for refreshments is very easily and satisfactorily solved by Knox Gelatin, right? So this is pretty early on. This is probably 1910, this advertisement is from. So here's a woman who's hosting and she needs to be able to feed her friends something dainty and delightful. And so Knox Gelatin is there to help. But why? Why is it all of a sudden so popular? Hmm? It's because the kitchen is changing. So we have new technologies, right? We have refrigerators, particularly once we get into the 1920s, the old ice box, if you can afford it, is out the window and you get an electric refrigerator instead, which means you have much um, colder and easier to regulate cold temperatures for chilled drinks, chilled desserts, chilled salads, right? That becomes super popular in part because of this new technology, this new fashionable, somewhat expensive technology. It takes a while for it to become more accessible to everybody. Um, you have problems staffing your kitchens. Turn of the 20th century, household help is hard to find. And there is a lot of complaining among middle and upper middle class women, even wealthy women about finding good household help that's affordable. So women are having to do more and more cooking on their own, which means they are turning more and more to convenience foods like gelatin. Finally, people are doing a lot more entertaining at home and entertaining not just in the evenings with dinner parties. They're having tea parties. They're having bridge parties. They're having people over for luncheon, right? They're having midnight suppers after they go to the opera or to the theater. They're having people over after that. They're having children's parties. Men are having stag parties, right? So all of a sudden, you have to have something new and interesting and tempting and not just the same old thing to please your guests, but also you have to be aware of how much work and effort you want to put into the menu that you probably have to do by yourself, unless it's a big enough party or you can afford to hire a caterer or you can afford to have a cook, right? So all of these things are affecting why Jell-O and gelatin desserts become so popular. All right. The other thing that's going on with gelatin and gelatin rhetoric, which definitely goes into the 20th century, is there's lots of rhetoric around health. So junket in particular has a lot of rhetoric around milk and healthfulness and children. So throughout the late 19th and 20th centuries, um, the conventional wisdom about health was that, about milk was that it was very healthy because it contained um, the three known food substances that were most essential to life. It has carbohydrates or sugars, it has um, protein, and it has fat all in one neat little creamy white package, right? So we don't really discover the 
vitamins until the 19 teens and we don't really discover a lot about vitamins until the 1940s right with world war ii so that's the conventional wisdom about milk at the time and that it is also essential for children right but getting kids to drink milk all the time not always the easiest so junk it and ice cream right was a way to get kids to drink more milk um, and again, a lot of the gelatin desserts, there's a lot of emphasis on kids too, which will explain why, which is why this is like this hilarious little picture from the Jello cookbook. It says at grandmother's the Jello hour and there's this little toddler and he's like totally destroying his grandpa, climbing on him, trying to get to the Jello. <laughs> Not that that's necessarily a great advertisement, but maybe it's supposed to be cute. I don't know. Anyway, um, the other thing that is really touted with gelatin uh, brands is the emphasis on protein and collagen content. So of course, gelatin is just basically collagen, right? So, um, and it kind of is a protein, but it's not actually really a protein. But I first started looking into this, into this because my mom had mentioned, and also somebody in a Food History Happy Hour to live program I do, um, had mentioned that their parents their moms had told them to eat jello because it was a good source of protein. I was like, what? That can't be right. But no, it's totally that was part of the marketing, which we'll get to. Um, gelatin foods are also really strongly associated with invalid or sick room foods, right? So for really until the early 20th century and then beyond, um, the woman of the house was in charge of caring for ill people, right? Early on, you're also in charge of medicating them, including making your own medicines. But by the 20th century, it's usually just food preparation. And the general consensus is that you want lots of liquids, things that are easy to digest, things that are fairly palatable. So you get stuff like beef tea and broth and blanc mange and jello and milk toast and junket. All of these foods are seen as healthful foods for people recovering from illness. And one of the reasons why is because of that protein and collagen content. So this is from the Junket cookbook lid. It says all children love Junket. And then it talks about how much milk people, kids should be drinking every day. And then they have a height and weight chart, right? So we're really framing Junket as a health food for children. And it also has like stuff even about digestion, right? It's, they're like, food, milk should be eaten rather than swallowed quickly as a beverage, right? Um, this is another 1919 Jell-O advertisement focused on how excited the kids are for their Jell-O and how gelatin is better for your kids because if you serve them whipped jello, you don't have to serve them all the fat and cream, right? And there's fruit in it, so that means it's healthy. <laughs> this is all advertising to try and get you to buy this stuff, right? This is from the Knox Gelatin Cookbook. These are all suggested recipes for the invalid and convalescence tray, right? If you are restricted to your bed, they bring you your food on your tray. Um, gelatin persists in hospital settings um, because it is technically a clear liquid, right? Particularly just straight up gelatin, because it basically, as soon as it, you eat it, it like melts in your mouth and your stomach, right? Um, so, and it's also easier sometimes to eat rather than swallowing liquids. So that's why it continues to be used in hospital settings, even though it doesn't really have any real nutritional value. <laughs> it should not be eaten long-term as a food replacement. So I also found this little cookbooklet from Knox. This is from 1961. So that tells you how long gelatin persists uh, in American culture as a food for the sick and convalescent. Right, and remember also, until we get reliable vaccines, childhood illnesses are very serious and common uh, throughout the United States. Lots of kids end up bedridden, sometimes for weeks at a time. 
Um, and so even though that's not really explicitly said in a lot of these um, little cookbooklets and references, that is kind of, I think, the primary audience for a lot of these foods. All right, gelatin and gender. What, what's going on with that? So here we have this advertisement for who likes jello? The average man likes jello, right? He who turns up his nose at the blancmange and floating island style of dessert, though he finds pie and cottage pudding heavy and indigestible, who is generally conceded by his fair companion to be so contrary that he only wants anything that does not agree with him and who refuses the charge by his liking of jello, right? Which is good for him, right? It's like so patronizing, but why are we having to advertise that men like it and men like a change all of a sudden? That is because gelatin is so incredibly gendered towards women at this point. This is from 1908. Right, so they're trying to convince that men like it, and this is like a thing that persists. This idea that men like Jello and kids like John. I'm like, do they know? Do they really like gelatin salads? They may like Jello dessert, but they and they want their tomato aspic on a lettuce leaf. I'm not sure. Here's another one. This is from the Royal Gelatin Cookbook. Here's one that hun hungry husbands like and finicky children thrive on. Right, then folks know the difference instantly. They're connoisseurs, right? So you gotta have the good stuff. This is a very classic one from 1952, talking about how men don't know how to cook, right? He's trying to bake a cake, it looks like, and he's very confused. He has a sweet little ruffled apron on, which I love. And it's like, no, if you're having trouble, you should just make jello instead, because it's easier. <laughs> and then we have gelatin and beauty, right? This astonishingly horrifying ad from 1955. This young woman who basically looks like she just has skin rolls and who can't touch her toes. <laughs> They're saying, no, you must be fat. Now is the time for jello because you can eat it for weight loss. I'm like, not really sure how that's going to work because it's basically just pure sugar, but that was the rhetoric at the time. Again, considered a good source of protein, right? Even though it's not really. Um, in 1925, Jell-O introduces Deserta, which is a sugarless Jell-O. Now it's just referred to as sugarless Jell-O. It's made with NutraSweet. Um, there's a lot of emphasis on weight loss, not just for Deserta, but also for other gelatin desserts. I guess they're supposed to be less fattening and calorific than ice cream or cake or pie, which technically I suppose they are, but there's also this really interesting emphasis on the use of gelatin in strengthening your nails and hair, which I guess it's technically collagen, but I'm not sure it works that way, companies. So here's an ad from 1956 for Deserta gelatin, right? There's all the calories, no calories. Here's one, this is from the back of that Knox gelatin cookbook for the sick and convalescent. So other free special diet books, one called, do you really wanna lose weight? Here's how Knox gelatin will help you. There's one for diabetics, right? Because of course Knox gelatin contains no sugar, unlike other pre-packaged gelatins like Jell-O and Royal Gelatin. And then interestingly, um, now you can do something positive about distressing broken and splitting fingernails. So here's how you do it in, with Knox Gelatin, right? This is from 1961. Um, this ad from the 1950s, keep your trim waistline with the popular Knox Weight Watchers drink. This is why I don't know exactly when they introduce this or when it goes away, but yes, for a while, Knox Gelatin was asking you to drink your gelatin to help curb your appetite. And then same thing in 1966, we still have our gelatin, Knox Gelatin drink, but this time we're talking about nail strength, right? Interesting, it's like grow your own. Don't wear fake nails, grow your own. Now, how does Jello? start to be associated with poverty and low class, because I think that is what a lot of people associate it with, 
today. It is not considered a high class, wealthy food like it was in the late 20th century, or sorry, the late 19th century. So what happens? In the 1970s, we have a decline in Jello purchases. Um, there's a number of reasons for this. Uh, the primary one is which that a lot of women start going to work, which you think that that would mean that more women would make Jello because it's supposed to be faster and easier than other desserts, right? However, you're forgetting that when women go to work, they're not having their friends over for bridge anymore, right? They're not having tea parties. They're not involved in women's clubs because they're working. So you get a decline in sales of gelatin. So what do companies do to alleviate that? Well, Jello introduces the Jello Jiggler. Gone are the savory salad gelatins of the 1960s and said they are laser focusing on children as their primary audience. You also see widespread use of gelatin in schools. It's cheap. It's easy to make. Kids seem to enjoy it. There may have even been some rhetoric behind, oh, it's protein, it's good for them, right? It's less calories than ice cream, right? That kind of thing. And you also see it used a lot in hospitals, which is to this day, the square of red gelatin with Cool Whip or whipped cream on top is like stereotypical hospital food. Although I guess now it's not a square, it's like an individual cup, right? So again, that's because it's basically a clear diet. It is easy to digest. It is easy to eat um, for people who might have some swallowing problems. It contains no real nutrition, <laughs> but that's why they keep serving it. And like I said, it's cheap, although it's not as cheap as you would think anymore, right? It's over a dollar a box now for, for brand name gelatin, um, which did not used to be the case. You could buy it for pennies. And there were some advertisements of, you know, like young housewives going over the household accounts and then there's boxes of jello saying, phew, we made it this month because we didn't buy expensive desserts. <laughs> so of course with jello jigglers, we have this unfortunate gentleman um, but thankfully, we do have cute kids also with Jello Jigglers. Um, not a lot of advertising for school and hospitals, so I will leave you with this and ask your favorite gelatin memory, and you should share it in the comments. Or sorry, in the chat, I should say, not the comments. And then if anybody has any questions, you can also drop those in the chat. If you want to know more about me, I do a website, thefoodhistorian.com, and I'm like every kind of social media there is. So if you can't think of a question off the top of your head and you think of one later, you can always track me down and ask me later. So that's my talk. I'm going to unspotlight myself. And if anybody has any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. Oh my gosh, I missed. What happened in the chat? I didn't see any of these. Oh my gosh, I'm missing so many things. Um, okay, so Karen wants to know, is there a book or website where we can go to see all these desserts? So any gelatin corporate cookbooklet that is published before 1927 is in the public domain. Um, you can often find them on archive.org. I know definitely the Knox gelatin one is there. Um, I think at least one of the Jello ones are there. Um, so yeah, Julie, yes, you're correcting me. Nails and hair are keratin, not collagen. Yeah, but for some reason people think collagen is good for your hair and nails. So I don't know where that comes from, but that was the rhetoric at the time. Sharon says, home ec in junior high, Jello with mixed fruit that we had to eat, just dreadful. Yeah, I didn't even go into Jello salads too much. Um, there's a lot of stereotypes about Jello in the Midwest, which is where I am from, but I think it's not so much that it's Midwestern food, it's that um, everybody in the 1960s and 70s was eating that way and it's just persisted longer in the Midwest than other places in the country. Um, yes, Melanie, my mom made a jello that was lemon and had cream cheese, carrots, pineapple, and cool whip. It's called Philadelphia salad. Yes, golden glow salad is lemon with carrots and pineapple and oranges. I think it might also be orange jello. 
you know, there's a whole bunch of crazy gelatin salad. Perfection salad, um, which is also the name of a book by Laura Shapiro, if you're interested in, in home economics, definitely check that one out. That was like a crazy mixture. It had like lime jello and cabbage and cottage cheese, I think. It was it's a strange, sweet, savory mixture. And I couldn't find an image of it, but I know I've seen reference to a Knox gelatin advertisement that was talking about how men don't like sweet salads. And so that was totally a dig at Jell-O. Because <laughs> of course, Jell-O is pre-sweetened. So they're telling you to use lime and lemon Jell-O, which has sugar in it and all of like these savory Jell-O ap salad applications. And Knox is like, men don't like sweet salads, so you should make your salad with Knox unsweetened gelatin instead, um, which I found very interesting. Uh, Sharon says, I think it was called poke cake, a bunch of cake my mother would poke holes in with a long stick and pour liquid jello and then chill. And when sliced and have jello stripes inside, yes, definitely people still make poke cakes today, although I think they are mostly with pudding rather than jello, but you do still see them sometime. Melanie, a friend, always made lime jello with cabbage in it. Yuck, no one would eat it. Yeah, I'm not sure. Definitely Americans, at some point, we stop liking savory gelatinous things, which is interesting because a lot of other cultures still have savory gelatinous things, particularly in Asia. Um, and for whatever reason, we like most of our gelatinous things sweet these days. So I don't know. Oh yes, Sharon mentions Jello shots in college. Murky history, supposedly invented in the 1950s um, by a military guy. So yeah, I didn't get into that either, but that's another repurposing of Jello in the modern era. And today there is kind of a revival of um, some of the more, <coughs> excuse me, I'm gonna take a drink of water. Some of the more historic gelatin recipes that call for, um, you know, like Knox gelatin that's not pre-sweetened sheets of gelatin or granulated gelatin. A lot of bakeries use gelatin to stabilize whipped cream um, or, you know, in some um, frosting recipes, things like that. Um, so I think it's kind of going back to the earlier versions um, that are a little bit more from scratch maybe than today's version. Uh, that we're used to. So, great comments, everybody. Oh gosh, Melanie, why is raspberry jello blue when raspberries are red? I have no idea. I think somebody wrote a thing about where blue raspberry comes from. I would have to look it up, but yeah, that's a, that's a weird thing. I don't know why they made it blue. I want them to bring back that black raspberry jello. That sounded great. <laughs> I did, when I was in the grocery store, I did look in the Jell-O section. And of course I'm saying Jell-O, but I just mean gelatin, not necessarily the brand name. It's like Kleenex or Xerox. It's just become kind of this shorthand for gelatin in the United States. Um, and I looked in the Jell-O section and I saw, it was fairly limited, which was surprising to me, but I did see a grape flavor and peach. And then of course there's all, all like the pudding, various puddings now. I didn't even get into puddings, but uh, yeah, yep. Ooh, sparkling peach jello. Yeah, I've, so I've seen a couple. I didn't want to try it for tonight because I thought the strawberry Bavarian cream just looked so good. Um, but I definitely think I am going to try uh, the sparkling. There's like a couple of early sparkling jello recipes that call for ginger ale, which sounds really good. So I might track one of those down for fun. Sharon, what's jello one, two, three? Is that like a specific type? I don't know what that is. Yeah, there's, do they have instant jello now? I know they have instant pudding. I think they have like a cold water gelatin now too, instead of just the hot water kind. But anyway, any other questions for me? Okay, thank you, Sharon. Jello 123 was a jello dessert that separated into three layers when chilled. What? Like, like, what do they call that? Impossible pie? <laughs> That's with eggs though. How does that work with jello? I'll have to look that up. I did not run across that one. That one's new to me. Okay. 
Yep, a regular jello and a creamy top and some other layer. It's probably a layer in between. Interesting. Yeah, that sounds a lot like impossible pie or there's like a lent, like a cottage pudding, I think, where you you mix in like the egg whites and then it separates out. I think there's like a cake and a sauce and like a topping. Anyway. Interesting that they also did that with jello. Oh yes, the classic pretzel strawberry jello salad. Um, I don't know if anybody follows my Midwestern mom on TikTok. Uh, if you are interested in jello salads and Midwestern food, you should totally follow her. She lives in Minnesota. Um, she starts out a lot of her little recipe videos on TikTok with, she sings a little song about, welcome to Minnesota salads, we're salads that aren't really salads. <laughs> jello salads pretty much are cookie salad right i grew up with cookie salad not as often as i would like um because my mom was pretty health conscious but she couldn't stop me from eating it at a potluck so oh jean says jello is popular with the amish in wisconsin for making jams and jellies their stores are full of different flavors in bulk interesting yeah, interesting. Yeah, I guess we saw Mrs. Knox talking about using gelatin in preserves. So they must still do that. Very interesting. Any other questions for me? Mm, Ellen says her mom made the jello modes with ginger ale in them. Did you eat them? Did you like them, Ellen? Were they yummy? Like what else did she put in there? Was it just the ginger ale? I am very sad that my Bavarian cream did not set. I think I might try making it again with the full envelope of gelatin. Yep. Because they are pretty. And I mean, I didn't talk about this in the talk, but um, I think another influence on the jello molds is the use of ice cream molds in the Victorian period, um, which were all different shapes. And you would like put different layers of colors. And, you know, sometimes there would be like, you know, like a fruit basket. And so the fruit would be all different tinted colors of ice cream and it would be frozen hard and it'd be like a little individual serving or sometimes a sliced serving. And gelatin, jello is a lot like that. So I think that there might be some connection there as well. Oh, interesting. Melanie says, my daughter makes jello sugar cookies. She adds jello powder instead of sugar. Interesting. I bet that's a pretty intense fruit flavor then too. Sharon sent her Tupperware jello molds to Goodwill. Oh wow. This is, so I will just say, I do love to collect stuff, but the pro I always have a space problem. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard to find the space for the cool stuff. That's why I just have the one, um, the one uh, pudding mold. Right, I don't have any jello molds, but I'm that's why I repurposed my pudding molds. Steamed or boiled pudding is what that's for. Julia says, I used to make jello with marshmallows and ginger ale with my grandma. It was nice. That does sound nice. I don't know. I don't I don't like jello. I will eat jello. I won't go out of my way to make it usually. Um just because I like cake better. <laughs> Right, I'm, I'm much more of a cake and ice cream girl. Um, but if there is jello in front of me, I will not turn my nose up at, up at it, unless maybe it has, it's like a savory gelatin. I'd probably try it though. I'll try anything once. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? Oh, Melanie, does jello expire? Man, I just had a conversation today with a friend about expiration dates. Yeah, so, um, there's no real regulation of expiration dates in the United States, so it's up to the individual companies to set them, and they are normally really best used by dates. So it's just if you want to maximize the quality of the food, you are to consume it before that date, um, particularly with shelf-stable foods. Uh, so because gelatin is pretty clarified. It probably lasts a long time. I do not know that I would eat gelatin more than a year or two past its expiration date because it is technically based on animal product. So up to you, up to you. I don't know if there's expiration dates on them though. I'll have to look that up. I have some in my 
kitchen. I could go look at the boxes, but good question, Melanie. I don't know the answer. Oh, Kim. Okay. Kim is asking about, were there any advertised that were specifically vegan? So there is no vegan gelatin. Um, there are vegan alternatives. Uh, carrageenan is a vegan alternative. Agar is a vegan alternative. Um, and there are some brands of gelatinous things that are like alternatives to gelatin that are specifically marketed as vegan. They usually don't set up as firmly. Right, so it's difficult to mold them. Um, and it's not actually gelatin. <laughs> so I don't know what any of the specific brands are. Um, but yeah, that's, I did not see any alternatives right there in the jello aisle. Yeah, nope. I also didn't see any organic gelatin, which it seems like it would not be hard to figure out how to do organic gelatin because we have organic meat. But somebody get on that. <laughs> for all, all the health conscious hipsters who want to recreate the vintage dessert, somebody, somebody get on the organic gelatin and the vegan jello. <laughs> oh, interesting. Julia says there are environmental issues with agar. The species are not well documented, but they are struggling. Interesting. I did not know that. Yeah, there's also some, some people have issues with the carrageenan, the Irish moss. Um, but it's more, I think, like a reaction issue. Like it doesn't agree with everybody. Um, yeah, interesting. All right, now I feel like I have to Google vegan, vegan gelatin and see what comes up. Because that is one thing I did not look up as part of the talk. See what it says. Okay, I'm looking at PETA. <laughs> we'll see what PETA says about gelatin alternatives. Obviously, eyes and glass is not allowed. Although, so Isinglass, I didn't mention this in the talk, but um, Isinglass is used in um, some kosher and halal foods because um, it does not contain any pork, potentially. And I think most gelatin is made from beef, but they don't really tell you. So, um, yeah, the Isinglass is a meat meat-free alternative, even though it's made from fish. Okay, so Simply Delish Gel Dessert is one. It doesn't tell you what it's made out of, though. So these are just brands that are out there. Um, Liebers, unflavored gel. And then they're also recommending agar agar and carrageenan as alternatives. Interesting. And then they have a recipe for making your own. Huh. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I know, uh, like custard desserts, a lot of vegans use flaxseed as an alternative. So I don't know if that could be an option. Oh, Kim, are you sending me? Does it tell you what it's made out of? Okay, veg vegetable gum, I guess, is what this particular bacon gel dessert is made out of. Interesting. I don't know what vegetable gum is. <laughs> answers that question. Any other questions before we are done for the evening? Well, thanks so much, Sarah.
Um, if anyone else has any questions, you know how to reach out to Sarah. Food is, was it the foodhistorian.com is the website, Sarah? Yep, I'll drop it in the chat here. Cool. And all her other social media stuff. So anything else comes to mind, please reach out to her or you can reach out to me and then I can pass it along to Sarah as well. But thanks so much. And we'll see you in August for your history of fast food, which should be pretty exciting. And I hope everyone has a good night. Um, the video should go out to you in the next couple of days or so. So if you missed something or you want to rewatch, you totally can. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks, Krista. Good night. Bye. -bye.